right? As we've been talking to a lot of church planters and church pastors, uh, we recognize the soil in the Bay Area can feel like concrete. And then COVID hit, and particularly for our planters in the room, you know, you worked so hard for a year or two years, and you found a groundswell of a community developing. And then given the cost and transience of an area like the Bay Area, so many people went, quote unquote, back to Michigan or Texas or North Carolina. And you don't even know what the center of your church is right now. And that's why we chose this topic uh, why Church Matters, and we're really blessed to have Dr. James K. Smith uh, approach an answer to that question. Uh, Dr. Smith's been here all weekend in other capacities, and so I've just been drinking from the Jamie fire hose over the last day and a half, and um, I'm beginning to recognize how much of my sermons are actually just riffs of some of his great work, so credit where credit is due. Uh, but Jamie has really taught me um, as a person to better understand what it means to be fully human and as a pastor what it looks like to really help ground our people in these Christian formation habits which become rhythms and rituals in our life and so I feel forever changed I said to our congregation this morning uh, I'd probably put Jamie in in the group of six or seven people that have had the most shaping influence on my life. So we're delighted to have him here with us tonight. He's going to address this question, why church matters, probably 30, 35 minutes or so. We'll transition to a discussion. So I'll launch a couple questions Jamie's way, just as grist for the mill, and then Nick will play roaming mic. So keep, keep uh, questions in mind as we go, because we want about half of this to be a conversation. Uh, do we need any housekeeping things? The restrooms are right outside. Uh, we'll be done at 7.30. And without further ado, I'm introducing Jamie Smith with the restrooms. That sounds really, just forget that part. Let's welcome Jamie Smith. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thanks so much. You guys probably have a lot more practice doing this than I do. No, 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 no. Um, good evening. Thanks for being here. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's, it's um, uh, and thanks for the opportunity, guys. It's, it's fun to be back in San Francisco. I used to spend a lot of time in San Francisco uh, when I used to do a lot of stuff with Praxis. Do you know the Praxis folks? Down in the Presidio, actually. And, um, uh, and City Church, old friends at City Church and things. So it's, it's uh, fun to be back. I, it's very intimidating for me uh, to talk to you all because I am not a pastor or a church planner. <laughs> and I feel very conscious about that. I'm like comfy, tenured philosopher uh, uh, who does, is not in the trenches in the way that you are. And so um, I, I say that because I would just very much like to be a catalyst for uh, you guys to, I think, share and process and, and think through some of these questions with one another. Uh, I'm also, I, I come from old Pentecostal stock and uh, tonight is what we call new manna which is, uh, I realized I needed to think through these questions afresh, so, so we'll, see. we'll see how this goes. Uh, I, I have spent a lot of my time um, trying to kind of make the case for why contemporary pastors would find surprising comfort from the ancient church. And so I spend, uh, uh, I guess a part of my kind of evangelism, if you will, is trying to convince people who are working in the 21st century that they should look back to the fourth and fifth uh, century for models. And I was encouraged to hear that Jerry Sitzer was here and I know he's very sympathetic to that project as well. And so maybe there's something in the water here. And I think the reason why you, we uh, uh, find sort of refreshing and surprising alliance uh, with those early uh, church um, uh, um, planters, so to speak, is precisely because they proclaimed uh, the gospel in a context that was way more like our own uh, than we might realize. That the, the world in which they proclaimed the gospel was more like our post-Christian context than the Renaissance world of the reformers, or let's be honest, than the heady days of church growth in the 1980s and 90s. Do you know what I mean? Like the world has changed a lot since then. And so your post-Christian context here in San Francisco is way more 
like the pagan world in which St. Augustine was laboring, than, um, you know, Orange County of Rick Warren. You know, like, it's just, it's just a, it's a completely different ball game. There was so much, you know, if you, if you sort of plopped yourself into Orange County in the 1980s, do you know how much Christian legacy is there from the transplants from the Midwest that settled that place? I mean, it's all, you're all just reminding people of things that they already knew. Whereas what you're doing in this, the post-Christian context in which you find yourselves, this, this secular age in which we find ourselves, is really so radically different and such a much more significant challenge, but you're not alone if you start reading the church fathers. You're not alone if you start reading Jerome or Augustine. And so I, I keep making this case for pastors and church planners today to cultivate ancient friendships and to sort of apprentice themselves to the likes of Tertullian and Jerome and Augustine who labored in a world where Christianity was seen as suspect and irrational. Sound familiar? I mean, they, they know exactly what you're talking about, what you're facing, and, and they understand how difficult ministry is for you. You'll find a sympathetic ear. They can, they can identify with the exhaustion and the frustration and the disappointment. And one of the things, one of the reasons why, I mean, I'm going to talk about Augustine, just, just like... I'm like Ricky Bobley. I'm contractually obligated to mention Augustine whenever I'm at a... And, and um, the reason, though, I guess I, I think Augustine is such an interesting character is because he was a bishop. And as a bishop, he was a pastor of pastors, right? So he's very, very attuned to his own role in trying to nourish and encourage the pastors who are serving under him. And I'd suggest that reading Augustine might be a way for you to find a bishop at a distance, so to speak. I, I know you're probably, some of you are in traditions where you're not supposed to like bishops, but you know what I mean. Uh, uh, you'll, find, uh, you'll find a bishop at a distance who sympathizes with your situation. There's a, there's a line from an early John Updike short story that I think about a lot when I think about the work that you guys are doing. It goes like this. This is from like the early 70s. The churches of Greenwich Village had this second century quality in Manhattan. So it had this cent second century quality. In Manhattan, Christianity is so feeble, its future seems before it. Sorry, let me read that one more time. I kind of messed up. The churches of Greenwich Village had this second century quality. In Manhattan, Christianity is so feeble, its future seems before it. Do you hear that? I hear that as a very suggestive way to reframe what we are engaged in today. What if you thought of yourselves as engaged in second century mission? Now, why would that, how would that make a difference? Well, of course, on the one hand, that would mean letting go, not only of sort of 20th century methods and assumptions and strategies, it also means letting go of 20th century expectations, but it really constructively means living into second century hopes, which were never pegged to what seemed probable or likely. <laughs> There was nothing probable or likely about the future that Christianity had if you were standing there in the second century. The hopes of those second century laborers were indexed to, some, to the most improbable, even impossible, which is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and the commission of Jesus who ascended to heaven. And... I, I say this, when I, when, when I say this, I don't mean to be trite and I'm not trying to be Pollyannish and, or, or I'm, just not like, I'm not here to be rah-rah, I hate that. And I, and I don't mean for a second to discount the real challenge and exhaustion of ministry today in your context. I, I, I want you to know, like, people see that, that's known, that's understood. I can't imagine what it has been like to be a pastor and a church planner for the last two years. Incredible. But 
So I'm not, I'm not skating over it by saying, let's, let's believe in the resurrection. <laughs> All I'm saying is, if you listen to that, that uh, uh, Updike line, the churches of Greenwich Village had this second century quality. In Manhattan, Christianity is so feeble, its future seems before it. If you start thinking in this second century mindset, what happens, I think, is I think that the only thing that could really truly nourish evangelism and church planning and discipleship under the conditions in which we find ourselves has to be a return to that resurrection center, right? It has to be, not because this looks like a really good strategy. So what if there is an untold history of Christianity in San Francisco yet to unfold? That's what it would mean to have a second century ministry. So the question for this evening is, and this is, I, I think this is Bart's fault that this is our question because it's a hard one, <laughs> which is why church or why does church matter? And I want to imagine with you, uh, because I, I don't think my perspective on this is, is anything particularly of interest, but I want to imagine with you how Augustine might answer that question. But before I get to that, I do want to just pause and I want to consider what sort of answer we should expect to that question. Why does church matter? What kind of answer are we looking for and what kind of answer should we expect? And I want to, I, I guess I want to say that if you're hoping for an answer to that question that, convi that would convince people who aren't yet Christians, I don't think you're gonna get that answer. And it's not because somebody isn't smart enough and we haven't figured it out and somebody hasn't articulated it. I, I, want, I want us to realize that in a way, if we're asking the question, why does church matter? And we want somebody to give us the answer that we can then give to the world so that they will start showing up at our, our, our plants and churches, I don't, I literally think that answer does not exist. It's impossible. There is not an argument for why church matters that could possibly convince non-Christians to come through your doors and join your communities. The philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein has this famous line. Wittgenstein is one of the great philosophers of the 20th century. Uh, um, he has this line in his philosophical investigations where, maybe you've heard it, if a lion could talk, we could not understand him. We won't get into it. It's actually really fun to think through. But if a lion could talk, we could not understand him. That's because the lion's language would emerge from a form of life that was just completely impenetrable to human upright bipeds. Do you know what I mean? Like the worlds inhabited are so radically different that even if you knew there was like, it would be like a Charlie Brown sort of thing. It'd be like wah, 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 and you could not understand him. And it's not because you're not hearing the sounds. It's because you don't share the world. You don't share the form of life. If a lion could talk, you, we could not understand him. And I guess what I want us to realize is that even if you have an answer to the question, why church matters, your non-Christian neighbors cannot understand you. What will happen is, it will end up, the answer, the want, want, want that you will say, and, you're, and they're human, so they're like, well, they obviously understand the words, but what's gonna happen is it's going to be heard as something else because they are coming from a form of life where they don't have the capacity to understand the claim. But by the way, this is not a despairing, this is, this is, I'm coming back to hope in a second. I'm trying to explain how we should expect to answer this question. Why does church matter? is if you come up with an answer to that and you think you can now articulate this to your non-Christian neighbors, what's gonna happen is they're going to hear it as another explanation for why they need therapy, why they need accountability, why they need to be ethical, why they need to be, it's just impossible for them to understand it because they come from a different form of life. So I wanna suggest, when we are asking this question, I hope I'm not disappointing you, Bart, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm always worried like the pastor's looking at me going, oh. um, 
So when we ask this question, why does church matter? Friends, we are asking it for ourselves. We are asking it for ourselves as Christians, as pastors, as people who have lived through the great unsettling of this pandemic and are wondering whether this is worth it. We need to ask this question for ourselves. Why does church matter? In fact, I would suggest you could even articulate, since, since we know we're answering this question for ourselves, maybe you could even put the question this way. Why does the world need the church even if it doesn't know it? That is a question we can answer. We can answer. And it's a question we have to answer for ourselves. Now, having an answer to that question uh, won't make your ministry any easier. Having an answer to that question won't mean newcomers are now beating down your door. But it will mean, if you have an answer to that question, it will mean that you have an understanding of the stakes of your vocation. And it will mean that you will find reassurance of just how much you are the hands and feet of the ascended Christ in the world. That's where we need to answer the question. Why does the church matter? Why does the world need the church even if they do, it doesn't know it? Well, okay. So now I want to imagine Augustine's answer to that question. Are we doing okay? Is that is ever nobody's like super disappointed or, or despairing yet? Okay. Augustine's answer, I think, goes something like this, and I'll unpack it. We need the church because we need community, because we need the sacraments and because we need to learn a different sort of timekeeping. Now, let me, let me try to encapsulate it this way, and this is a slightly provocative, and we'll get to it. In other words, I think Augustine's answer to the question, why do we need the church? Why does the church matter? Why does the world need the church even if it doesn't know it? Because the world needs a body politic. We'll talk about it that is an incarnate community of friendship, nourished by grace, who knows what time it is. An incarnate community of friendship, nourished by grace, who knows what time it is. That body politic is called, for Augustine, the church. Now, I wanna dive into those, there's three components there and I wanna dive into each of them, but before they do that, I wanna put one more sort of uh, um, theme on the table that's really, really important for Augustine. This, this core conviction governs all of Augustine's thinking about the church. And by the way, I would just say this, uh, uh, um, I think some of the best um, reflective work that church planners can do is to be deepening their understanding of ecclesiology, right? To deepen our understanding of just what is this body that is the church. And the governing principle of Augustine's ecclesiology is a Latin phrase that you can now use and impress people at cocktail parties with, totus Christus, totus Christus, and it simply means the whole Christ. And I wanna see if I can unpack this for you because I think it's kind of a mind-blowing paradigm shift for thinking about the church. So Augustine constantly talks about the whole Christ, the totus Christus. And what he's doing is he takes seriously the New Testament picture that says the church is the body of Christ. Okay, so it's his way of taking seriously that the church is the body of Christ. Now, I might be mistaken about this, but I think, especially those of us who are probably Protestants, tend to treat this mostly the body of Christ language. I think we tend to treat this mostly as a metaphor that is supposed to emphasize the organic connectedness of the members of the church to one another. Does that sound like a plausible 
Do you think that's a bit of a tension? We tend to think of, when we use the body of Christ's language, I think what happens is we tend to hear that language through the, through the lens of Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. And when the body metaphor is invoked in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, it is very much about that sort of the connective tissue that weaves together all of these disparate members and people into one body, right? And so we, we think of it as an organic unity metaphor for the most part. And of course, that's true. That, that's absolutely true. But... There is another way that this New Testament metaphor of the body of Christ works, and this is the one that Augustine seizes on. When Augustine reads or hears body of Christ, he's not reading it primarily through Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. He's reading it through John 1 and Colossians 1. Now, why does that make a difference? Because he's emphasizing that if the church is the body of Christ, then it is connected to the head of the church who is the ascended Christ. In other words, the church as the body of Christ is the extension of the incarnation in the world through time. Is that kosher? Is that, I, don't, I never know exactly what's heretical because I'm a philosopher. But I think this is, this is exactly the radicality of how Augustine thinks about the church. If the church is the body of Christ and a body is connected to the head, then the head, the ascended Jesus, his body is present in the world, in time, in the church. I, I honestly think, friends, that we tend to, as, as evangelical Protestants, to either implicitly or at least functionally, I honestly think we operate as if the body is decapitated. All right, it's a jarring metaphor, but I think that's the way we kind of work. And we, or, or, or it's like some weird sci-fi scenario where we know the head is somewhere else and we can send and receive messages. But we really, I think, functionally operate as if somehow it's not the whole Christ. But Augustine's notion of the totus Christus, the whole Christ, emphasizes this utter integrity and connectedness, not only of the members of the body to one another, but of the body to the head, so that the, the body of Christ is, as I said, this extension of the incarnation in the world through time. I, now, I think that way of seeing it is daunting, but also man, what, that's what the church is. Why, if you ask, in some ways, could there be a more fundamental answer to the question, why, why does the body of Christ matter? Why does the church matter? Because it is literally how Jesus is in the world in time. So let me come back to how I think Augustine would answer our question. Why does the church matter? The world needs a body politic, that is an incarnate community of friendship, nourished by grace, who knows what time it is. So let me, let me dive into each of these and, and, and let's talk about, first of all, a community of friendship. Um, for Augustine, we cannot be ourselves without friends. It's a really, really interesting theme in Augustine's Confession. You actually cannot find yourself without friends. You can't be yourself alone. This seems, this seems like a really, really timely theme for us. We, we could say a lot more about it. But at one point in uh, um, the confessions, which I know you all sleep with under your pillow, uh, uh, um, he says, I couldn't be happy without friends. I couldn't be myself without friends. One of the things that's really interesting, and this probably speaks to a lot of why you do what you do right here. When Augustine was like honestly cajoled and like almost bullied into being the bishop. He didn't want to. Uh, he said the only condition, he would accept the role on one condition, that he could continue to live in the monastic community that he had devoted himself to because he knew he would be terrible if he was alone. This sense of a, 
a pastoral community that surrounded him in his ministry, I think is, is such a powerful picture of the necessity of community, of the need for friendship. So why does the church matter? Because the world needs friendship to become human. Now, for the church to matter, the friendship we're talking about here can't be just another club, another affinity group, another place to connect. Do you know what I mean? Like it has to be distinctive somehow. So what sort of friendship is the church supposed to embody that the world needs? Well, the church is called to be a community of friendship beyond preference, without condition, where someone will experience a love that will never let them go. Now, that's a high calling for the church, and there are a lot of churches who fail at this. But if the church is going to matter, that's the kind of community of friendship we need to embody. The church is called to be a community that functions as an icon, a window through which people see God's covenant love. A place where people are seen and known and loved in spite of it all. uh, Bart and I were talking about, or Bart's sick of hearing me uh, from me this weekend. But there is, do y'all remember a scene in Mad Men where Don Draper, how many have seen Mad Men? No, the series Mad Men, okay. If you haven't, it's fine. There's a character, main character Don Draper is actually not really Don Draper. His name is Dick Whitman. He's somebody else. Spoiler alert if you haven't seen it. Um, and, And there's only one person left in the world who knows that. And it's the real Dick, Dick Whitman's widow. There's a, a really, really powerful scene in which uh, Dick goes back to California. Don Draper goes back to California, sees Dick Whitman's widow. She's the only one who knows all of his secrets. And she says to him, I know everything about you, and I love you. I know everything about you, and I love you. That is basically what every soul wants to hear. And it is exactly the kind of community of friendship that the church is called to be. One of of my favorite pictures, and, and by the way, a community that functions this way is not super sexy. Like, honestly, it's not, it's not like, it has nothing to do with how hip and impressive you are. It is so quotidian to be a kind of place where people are just welcomed, loved, and, and, and surrounded without condition. It's one of the reasons why one of my favorite pictures comes from um, Lars and the Real Girl. Do you know the movie Lars and the Real Girl with, with the gorgeous Ryan Gosling? Uh, um, I think this is one of the best pictures of the church in the history of cinema. So if you're, if you're not familiar with the film, it's, it's this great, great story that <laughs> revolves around a really, really kind of awkward situation in which this young Lars, it's in Minnesota, young Lars is um, a really, really broken, broken individual who is living in a complete delusion about the world and so has actually decided that a sex doll is a girlfriend of his who's a missionary home on furlough. It's a crazy setup. But what happens is one of the most beautiful, powerful portrayals of the church that I've seen on film. And what what does this tiny, nondescript Lutheran community do when Lars is going through this like crazy, wacky, uh, 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 um, sad and heartbreaking scenario? They just surround him and work to love him through it. There's, there's a scene, I, I wanna, can I highlight just one scene from the film? There's a scene later in the film where what's happening is Lars is really working through trauma and loss. And what's happening now is he's actually attributing the slow death to Bianca. So Bianca is dying, his, his girlfriend slash doll. Bianca is dying. And you know, the rest of the town knows this is not a human being. But they're, they're surrounding Lars. And uh, um, there's a kind of vigil happening 
okay? And uh, um, during this vigil, one morning, Lars wakes up and he rubs his eyes and he sort of stumbles out and he walks out onto the porch and gets some fresh air and he turns back and he sees the entire porch is filled with flowers from the community. And then when he walks back in the living room, he finds, he didn't even notice before, but there's a bunch of old ladies knitting on the couch, okay? And, and it's almost like the, the clicking of their needles is sort of the soundtrack of compassion. And they're just, they don't, they're not coming to explain anything. They're not coming to solve anything. They say, we brought casseroles, which is exactly what you do in Minnesota. And so Lars, he kind of sits quietly and he's moving his food around his plate and he says, is there anything I should be doing right now? No, dear, you eat, one of them encourages. We just came over to sit. That's what people do when tragedy strikes. They come over and sit. Friends, I, I think that is such a model for the kind of community of friendship the church is trying to be. We are called to be a people who come to the world and sit. We sit with the world, we are present with it in its tragedy, and you might not have imagined it, but sometimes the good life looks like casseroles in the quiet sadness of a mournful home like that. It's like a table prepared in the wilderness because it's prepared by people who are hoping for a feast to come. Augustine says, why does the world need the church? Because it needs a place where people learn how to be friends like that. Second reason, we need a body politic that is nourished by grace. And so for Augustine, and this is me, I, I'd be intrigued to hear how conversation goes about this. I know, I know we, we're not all coming from the same theological frameworks. I'm just telling you what Augustine thinks. Uh, um, which is really close to what Jesus thinks, but we can talk about that later. I'm just kidding. Uh, um, so Augustine has a very um, sacramental understanding of what the church is and therefore what it offers the world. And I guess I should just say, to put my cards on the table, I think that sacramental vision is what I would need to nourish my work <laughs> in the sorts of uh, trenches that you are working in. And I hope you can see how this works. For Augustine, as the body of Christ, which is the extension of the incarnation, the church is the host of the sacraments, which are, you can now think of as the most potent sites of God's incarnate presence in the world today. Again, of course, the world doesn't, need, doesn't know that they need them. <laughs> Do you know, like there's no, it's not like, oh, people are looking around saying, oh, where can I get the Eucharist? Do you know what I mean? Like, no, that's not, that's not going to happen. They don't know that they need them. By the way, sadly, too many Christians don't know that they need them. But it's interesting that if you read Augustine's sermons to the catechumen, if, 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 um, if I have any modicum of a success in convincing of anyone of anything tonight, if some of you go and pick up Augustine's sermons and start reading them, my work here will be done. And if you listen to Augustine's sermons to catechumenates, that is people who are like considering the faith, who are seekers, who are exploring, one of the things that's interesting is to see how he tries to bring them to a place where they might become hungry for the sacraments. And if you watch the pedagogy by which he does that, these sermons are just great examples of catechetical pedagogy. Uh, um, he tries to really invite people to the end of themselves. He's really kind of inviting people to reach the end of their own mastery, their own competence, their own brilliance, and their own expertise. In some ways, it takes a certain failure to become hungry for the material grace of the sacraments. Does that make sense? And, and I think what, this is, this is the, the world I think you folks especially inhabit is a world of so many brilliant, expert, competent, amazing people for whom their own mastery of the world is the hurdle. Their own mastery of the world is the obstacle. And it's very, and, and, and uh, um, 
I think it's very unsettling to come to the realization that you can't convince someone of that need. You can't open them by tapping into their expertise. It actually comes precisely when they reach the limits of that, when they range beyond it. And uh, um, there's no formula for that other than a community being faithfully present to be there when the failure hits in some ways. The third theme, I'll, 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 I'll try to finish up briefly here, but uh, the third theme that I think is interesting for Augustine is, so the world needs a church because it needs a body politic that is this sort of communion of friendship that is nourished by the grace of the sacraments and is characterized by a peculiar kind of timekeeping. Now, here's what I mean by that. It might seem odd, but I think Augustine would say that the world needs the church because the world doesn't realize the way it needs a people who are fruitfully out of step with the present. That is, the world needs a people who know what time it is which is not the time that everybody's watches say right now. It's not the time of the zeitgeist. Uh, um, maybe another way of saying this is what the, what, the body, what the world needs is the church to be an eschatological people whose understanding of the now is indexed by the to come. And who understand that the, the church the church should be a people who resist the tyranny of the urgent. The church should, be, should keep time in such a way that it also resists a nostalgia for the past. And that's because we are a futural people whose way of life is indexed to an ascended king and a coming kingdom. And so this is where, uh, um, we could talk about this some more if you want, but uh, uh, in Augustine's City of God, he really emphasizes that one of the reasons why the body of Christ learns to have a kind of strange patience, uh, maybe, maybe it'd be better almost call it a sanctified impatience sometime, but the church knows how to wait and long at the same time. The church is that people who every single day pray, thy kingdom come. That is a prayer of yearning. Who, who with the prophets are yearning for the kingdom to arrive, for justice to rain down with, like water and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. But we are also then the people who know how to wait and not try to impose the kingdom in the meantime, right? We know that we are working on a timeline that is not up to our mastery. It's not up to our planning and programs and progress. That there's, a, there's this space in which we inhabit this, this uh, tension productively. And I, I, I will say, I, I do think just as a mode of cultural analysis, I think one of the reasons why everything is terrible, <laughs> right? Why everything is so fraught is because I actually think we have no cultural patience left for anything but it's also because we are so confident in our own ingenuity that we think we should just be able to engineer the arrival of utopia. And why is it not here yet? And I think for the body of Christ to show how to both yearn and long and wait and be patient is an incredible witness to the world. Uh, and I think people who are gonna get burned out on their hunger might be looking for places to understand this. Okay, uh, how am I doing on time? I didn't really. Okay, I want to finish with just a picture. It, it, it comes from a novel by Iris Murdoch. Has anybody ever read Iris Murdoch? Yeah, great. Um, uh, it's a little novel that nobody reads anymore called The Bell. It's from, this is from mid uh, 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 20th century. And The Bell is, it's, uh, it's a story of this kind of quasi-monastic community. I was going to make a Benedict option joke here, but I won't. Uh, it's basically a bunch of people who are really sort of scared and tired of the world. And so what they decide to do is they're going to create a monastic community and they're going to retreat into this holy center called Imber Abbey. 
and there they will escape the world and they will just live according to God's principles. You should not be surprised that it does not go well. Okay? Because here's the thing. As much as you might want to get away from the world and into the sort of purity of Imber Abbey, the problem with that whole project is all of us go into Imber Abbey. <laughs> and it turns out, oh, a little bit of the world comes with us, right? But one of the things that the novel, it's, it, by the way, it's a really interesting uh, um, parable almost of, of how our best intentions yield some of the worst unintended consequences. Uh, and, and so in that sense, it's very telling, I think, almost as a leadership uh, read together. But I want to get to the very end. There's, there's the, the, um, the lay people who live in a big house on the grounds, and then there's an abbey uh, where uh, some nuns live, a convent where nuns live. And the nuns are cloistered, right? So they're behind the screen. They live entirely within this world. And uh, folks from the lay folks can come and see them and talk to them through a screen like once a week. It's very, very limited contact. And the nuns are committed to this cloistered life. Well, long story short, we get to a scene at the end of the novel where a bunch of bad decisions have been made by several people <laughs> and actors. And one of the lay people, Dora, is actually in threat of drowning in a lake on the grounds. And she is flailing around at the end of the grounds. And I want to take you to that scene, and I want you to hear, see, try to picture this with Iris Murdoch. What happens is, when there is this sort of emergency situation, there arises, and this is her phrase, an intrepid and amphibious nun who comes to the rescue. So when Dora is flailing in the lake and her poor decisions are threatening to take her under, across the surface of the lake, she saw a black figure beginning to disrobe. And the next moment, there was a splash. Dora's next memory is the nun drenched in her underclothes, hauling Dora to shore. It was certainly a strange scene, she writes. Most of the men muddied to the waist, two half-drowned women, and Mother Claire swinging the coat over her shoulders. While those who had gathered in the precincts of Imber's grounds were kind of concerned about incursions of the world into their life, what I love about this picture is that it's the excursion of the amphibious nun that surprised them and saved Dora. The amphibious nun answered the call from inside the cloister because she was willing to relinquish even her modesty to risk her vow to be cloistered for the sake of someone outside. In the end, I think the swimming nun is a great picture of the church's calling in this modern world. We are called to be amphibious, to be at home in the not yet, but willing to swim out into the now to reach those who are flailing. Such a calling could only be sustained, could only possibly be sustained by the grace of an amphibious God who stripped himself to nothing and swam to us in the flesh. The church is that body today. Jesus swims to the world in the body of the church. And people flailing need to grab on, but we need to be there for them to fight. Amen? I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. So I want to just throw a couple questions your way. Gris for the mill, Nick's roaming mic, so uh, keep your questions coming. But I know for me, um, I'm the kind of guy who uh, about every January, I have a new resolution that I want to start journaling. Okay. And so I have about 25 journals that I've written three or four pages in. Yeah. So they stop at like January. Do you get a new moleskin every year? New moleskin every year. <laughs> Journal. That's, that's worth like it. It's, that's worth it right there. It's January, what, 15th or 16th. I, I'm already done. I broke, I broke the. <laughs> and I say that to say I feel like over the years, a rule of life has been deeply meaningful to me because it just keeps me 
centered on a few things rather than just popping resolutions every year, things like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. To the topic, um, yeah. I, I feel like to lead churches uh, into this question and then Augustine's answer on why church matters, uh, it starts with pastors and planters cultivating a community of friendship, the grace of the sacrament, a kind of untimely timekeeping in our own lives. And I just wonder, how would you instruct us to do that? When you think about those three points and you think about planters and pastors, uh, what sorts of things might we be doing in our own trellis and vine rule of life that might help us with those three dynamics? So you're going to start with practical right away. <laughs> uh, me, the philosopher, you're going to ask me practical questions. So, yeah, I, I mean, um, I, I, I don't know what's possible. and It would be interesting to hear what others are doing. I, I think uh, it seems to me um, probably one of the greatest threats of the ministry in which you find yourselves is a vocational loneliness. Is that fair? Like, does it feel like a very lonely vocation in the sense that um, you might not always have peers in your immediate context, right? So there's a kind of loneliness. And I would say, honestly, like what you're doing right here, I bet is very life-giving, and I bet people wish they had something more like this. I don't know how it works in big cities, but to imagine um, you know, a community of pastors and planters who sort of commit themselves to a shared pastoral rule and but that doesn't is not just like up to you on your own now you're supposed to keep these rules but it like you find ways for it to find communal expression so that you are in one another's presence right it's not just checking a box every day it's more like how can we we realize that we need to take care of our own spiritual lives with one another in order to be able to give ourselves away to everyone else. And does that happen? I mean, do, do, is it, or is it so impossible given all of your responsibilities? I think it definitely happens, but I think you have to be super intentional yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, say a bit more on the third piece of timekeeping for <laughs> us because we, I mean, you would use the, the term cultural liturgy. It's right. Like we have taken on this immediacy, this impatience. Yeah. We're already, we've already imbibed. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's the next sermon, it's the syllabus or the fundraiser that you're going to go convince all of your donors of why your church plan is so important. You know, yeah. it's the next pastoral yeah. counseling session. Like we're already living in the tyranny of the urgent. Yeah. So what can we do as individuals yeah. or and this in is, communities? And this, this is where I don't know, you know, I think we're all coming from different places. So I don't know what we, we share in common or assume. Uh, two things come to mind for me, and I, I know you and I think in this framework, but I guess the liturgical calendar is a given for, for me, and I know that's not true of, for everyone, and so maybe I should say, I actually think the liturgical calendar is a really, really powerful discipline for learning how to like synchronize your watch to a different star, <laughs> right? Like to, to uh, um, there, there's a certain, I experienced this as an academic where one, one semester I did an experiment where I actually took the academic calendar of the, the course and I overlaid the, the liturgical calendar on top of it for the students. One thing that becomes really interesting is spring break usually falls during Lent. <laughs> so if you want to feel a little tension about how you keep time, uh, but um, I, I guess I find both for communities, but also personally as pastor, family, you know, individual, I do think the rhythms of the liturgical calendar um, sort of, I don't know, take the heat off of other kinds of calendars in my life, like the academic calendar or the, I don't know, something like that. Uh, the other practices, and I don't, I don't know how this works out for pastors, but it absolutely is essential and you have to figure it out, is Sabbath. Sabbath is the practice of letting go of the idea that it all depends on you. That's really what pra Sabbath is, right? It's not about rule keeping. It's not about not doing. It's about finding some way to just be reminded that it doesn't depend on you. And uh, um, I think the practices of Sabbath are 
powerful. Yeah. So my last question that's out to you guys. Um, this, is, this is not a challenge to the consistency uh, or coherence of your talk. Okay. So let's start there. <laughs> The first part but. Of your, but no, the first part of your talk, you I forget who you're quoting, but you said if a lion could talk, we would not understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was this notion that uh, our non-Christian friends, neighbors, coworkers, uh, they they if we were to even posit an answer to the question why the church matters, yeah. they wouldn't even get it. And yeah. and, and which I totally okay. resonate with where you're okay. going there. However, you can disagree with me. Oh, I know. Okay. Here's a community of, of deeply intentional people, deeply missional people. You get into your points around this uh, community of friendship, grace of sacrament, peculiar timekeeping. I forget how you said it. Um, invitations to those people into those three things yes. Yes. is what moves the needle on the gospel. Yes. Yet, back to the first part of your talk, these two worlds do seem so far apart. Like, how do we yeah. begin to integrate yeah. them? So I, I, the one thing I had in mind, and, and you tell me if this is feasible, when I say they wouldn't understand the answer, what I mean is I don't think there's a discursive way to explain this to them. What I do think they will experience is taste and see. So in other words, I, I, when we articulate these things for ourselves, the world needs the church because it needs you know, that kind of friendship. It needs this kind of nourishment of the sacraments. I don't think people could understand it if you explained it, but I think people will respond to it if they taste it, right? Because I do think that they are speaking to built-in human hungers. So the question, so now the question is, okay, well, how do you get them to experience it? And, and I guess this is where you're the experts and I'm not. All, all I'm imagining is it won't be because you have beforehand intellectually convinced them that they should do this and this and this. It will be because you have met them. You, you be the amphibious nun who swims out to where they are and it, it might be meeting them in their tragedy, it might be meeting them in their failure, it might be meeting them in their exhaustion and, and actually sort of being attuned and attentive so that you realize the hunger and instead of trying to give the answer to the question, you invite them to the meal that's, that's the beginning of, of feeding that hunger. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? So it's like a more, um, not, it's more show than tell. It's, and uh, I, well, I, I know, I know I'm being absolutely naive about how this works. I, I get it. Um, well, in some respects, it's simple yet deeply complicated yeah. and challenges our own selfishness because I think of uh, Leslie Newbegin talking Great. about the hermeneutic of the gospel as the beloved community. Yes. So yes. we actually have to yes. cultivate churches where real love and real relationships yes. are happening. Yes. It's not a show. Yes. Yes. But, can, I, can we also say, I, I mean, um, I, I know you all experience a lot of suspicion of the church in the Bay Area. Yeah? Is that a fair thing to say? Um, I do. There'd be some way to talk about how and why the church should own that and not deflect it. Do you see, do you see what I mean? In other words, can we just sort of... I, I, I do feel like we would get a lot of... I think there would be real power in the church also being a confessional community that, that took stock of how and why we are seen in that way. And to not make our first move be defense, but our first move be to say, I'm listening and here's the thing, there's a lot that you're right about. <laughs> Do you, like I, I'm just thinking of, especially for those of us who are coming from certain places and traditions on on race, the church just has a lot to confess. This is a lot to confess, and and I don't think we should rush to explaining or defending, and and don't think how cruciform that posture is. 
I think to take up a posture that is cruciform is its own witness. And to feel like we don't have to protect ourselves or defend ourselves. I, I, again, th this is, there's all kinds of qualifications here. All I'm saying is don't underestimate how powerful that could be as a witness. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Well, Nick's got the mic. And honestly, I want to make room for like pushback and, and also for you guys to be co talking with one another. This is your chance to be your community. Um, so Augustine had uh, a broken relationship with sexuality yeah. and with women, and he had a really weird attachment to his mom. Um, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, his mom <laughs> had weird attachments to him. Yes, too. yes, right, yeah, right. But, um, so I, I really, I, I was pleasantly surprised tonight. I, I really enjoyed the things that you were highlighting about his life. Um, all that stuff, though, before it made me hesitant to uh, go further into his work. Um, it made me hard. It, ma it made it hard for me to like receive it without some serious red flags. Um, I was wondering. You, 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 you obviously have taken a lot from his life. Um, do you see that at some point he? pursues health when it comes to that part of his brokenness? Or, or do you see signs of God's grace in his life that you know, he was a person on the way just like the rest of us and yeah. that there's grace and redemption and you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, 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 it's great. So um, I have a whole book on this. It's called On the Road with St. Augustine. And there's chapters on sex and mothers. And uh, I think uh, and and I, I, the, all, the, all the worries are absolutely fair and need to be worked through. So I'm, I, I, what I would say is sometimes the way to be most, most faithful to an Augustinian intuition is to be critical of Augustine. So for example, on sex, I actually think Augustine's own conclusions about sex are inconsistent with his own convictions about the goodness of creation. So I sort of read him against himself and say, if Augustine didn't have such sort of honest, like serious kind of hangups, he could have gotten to a place where uh, um, you could articulate an Augustinian affirmation of the good. And by the and I, I highlight some spaces in other preaching where he actually does that. You, you hear him doing that. Uh, Augustine on women, there's just uh, uh, um, so many like terribly predictable conclusions he comes to, and yet actually the way he talks about Monica in the Confessions deconstructs all of that, and so he should be thinking more consistent. So yeah, I, I actually think um, you have to go through those challenges, and I'm, I have no interest in sort of like, it's not hagiography for me. It's just that I also think he is one of the most penetrating thinkers the church has ever produced. And this is just a free footnote. The other subtext is, and this is what I try to pull out in the book, actually the 20th century is almost governed by historic engagements with Augustine by key thinkers who go on to influence the rest of the world. So uh, um, Martin Heidegger, who really launches existentialism, all of it came from his Augustine, reading Augustine's Confessions. Albert Camus, right, the, the stranger, myth of Sisyphus. Camus did his dissertation on St. Augustine. So it was also, I, I actually think he's an interesting character uh, because of that. The last thing I'll say is this. A lot of people forget that Augustine was African. And Augustine was really a kind of bicultural, biracial uh, 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 um, thinker and, and person. <laughs> and so there's this great book by, um, oh, my old man brain. Um, Cuban historian uh, Gonzalez, Justo Gonzalez, thank you, uh, called the Mestizo Augustine, which says, why, why would Augustine give to the legacy of the church this vision of living between two worlds, the city of God and the city of man? He says, well, he lived that by reality, that, 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 that sort of conflicted reality in his home, in his life, in his whole experience. I think he becomes fascinating for, for that reason. So um, he's only one of the sources we could be going back to, but I, I think he's kind of, you could spend a lifetime learning from him, that, which has been my experience. I, I'm assuming, I, we're getting the questions, but I'm assuming everyone in this room um, is here knowing some about you, but I think it would be reasonable if you would give us 30 seconds on 
Homo liturgicus or being creatures of desire, like oh, because like, that is also with, yeah. So the other, I guess, the, what do you want? One of my core sort of projects has also been an Augustinian idea. Um, so Augustine's confession says, "You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you." Right? That centering of hearts and loves and longings, I think, is the way to make sense of our current cultural context. And so what, what I argue following Augustine is that really human beings are defined not primarily what they know or think, but by what they love and desire and crave and long for. But those loves and longings are not just built in and hardwired. They're learned and acquired and trained by the disciplines and practices, the rituals and routines that we immerse ourselves in, which I call liturgies. And so you, you, there are cultural liturgies everywhere, but it's then also why the body of Christ is the retraining ground for rightly ordered love. Is that, is that helpful? Okay. Uh, so your, your comment about the, the totus Christus, yeah. um, and it's not just the interconnection of of the body of Christ itself, but sort of like your idea of kenosis, of us going to people, yeah. swimming out. Yeah. How do you get you know, faithful people of the church to embody that themselves? Would you say that's through liturgy? Would you say that that is through worship? How In would other you... words, how do you cultivate that sensibility? Yes. yes. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, uh, great question. I think you guys are supposed to have these answers. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, so I think of it as it's going to be multifaceted and it's ongoing. Um, so I do think the sort of heart of Christian formation is in how we are formed in worship, right? Liturgical practices. Obviously, that has to be deepened and expanded with all kinds of spiritual disciplines and practices that keep reinforcing that story in people's lives. Um, and catechesis, like, gent like real sort of like getting people to think about why they do this work. The other piece, though, um, that, that the Christian tradition and Aristotle and everybody has always emphasized about how you learn to be that kind of person is imitation, right? It's practices and it's imitation, which means um, don't ever underestimate the power of continuing to hold up exemplars of people who model being the swimming nun, do you know what I mean? Who are giving themselves away and to see how um, enticing that is. Like people want, like Bart's sick of me hearing, say, hearing me say this, but like I, I, I just have to tell you, like I'm this 50 year old guy who is like absolutely smitten by Mr. Rogers. Like, I, I think Mr. Rogers is the strongest, one of the strongest characters I've ever known because he's so meek and gentle. And uh, um, I, I think holding up exemplars to imitate is something that we can do from, you know, the history of Christianity, but I also think it's something we could do better in our congregations because you know what? The people who often best exemplify that are not up on stage. Do you know what I mean? Like they're, they're precisely the people who are out giving themselves away. And I think um, maybe that's another way of saying testimony is a way that this happens. Um, so that, that's not an adequate answer, but I think those are pieces of it. Does that, you think that sounds, yeah, great. In uh, the, the threefold kind of pattern that you give of the vision of the church, the first two of community, of friendship, um, and, and sacraments, yeah. basically, do you, do you find any tension between those two or maybe, mm. maybe like an out of balance mm. uh, sense there? I just, I'm thinking of kind of two like vision or like stereotypes of ways church can can go yeah. wrong. Yeah. One being like the social club where it's just some sort of glorified coffee hour and the second where sacraments and liturgy is so high that there is no community development. Do you find any yeah. uh, tension between those? Yeah, no, I think, I think it's a very, very fair observation, which is to say we're holding up a model of maybe what is not like typical. But I think you're, I remember one time talking to Ross, Ross Douthat 
And he was like, you know, one of the reasons, because he, he, he actually came through some like Pentecostal experience as a younger person. And he said, you know, one of the things that really drew me to the Catholic Church was I didn't have to talk to so many people on church on Sunday, <laughs> which is a sort of stinging indictment, it seems to me. Um, I, I think that's right, that, that what we're talking about should be um, uh, the, the conjoining of the two. And it, maybe it doesn't surprise, like I do think the sort of unique apostolate of evangelicalism has been um, uh, eating and eating food together, small groups, you know, like it's not, it's not accidental that small groups is really sort of the indigenous missional community of, this, of evangelicalism. And I think it's a great thing. I think it's a powerful, powerful thing. Um, it's just unfortunate that we tend to think of these things as mutually exclusive when they absolutely do not have to be and actually cannot be if we're going to become the kind of people that, that's, uh, um, uh, I think, answer all of these hungers. W one thing I didn't mention is, uh, and maybe we don't want to get into it, but I, I guess another reason why I think the sacraments are important, and that's the package, if you will, of things that goes with that, is because I do think Catholicity is important for the church. And what I mean by that is I think we need an account of how we are all one body across our streams and traditions and congregations. And the reason why I think that is important is that there, we have to have a good account of our oneness and unity in the face of um, the challenges of a secular world. Do you know what I mean? Like, like we seriously need to, um, that the church spends so much time infighting is just insane to me given how much needs to happen looking outward. And so it's, there's, to me, the, the sort of, maybe what I'm saying is the package that comes with sacramentality, I think, is also a certain kind of repertoire of narrative worship that, that can be shared across, it's not owned by anyone. It's really important to me that Rome does not own Catholicity. I have a little pet peeve where if somebody says they're Catholic, and I, I say, you mean Roman. Because I'm Catholic, and I'm Dutch Reformed. Do you know what I mean? So there's, there's, Catholicity is not owned by one of those traditions. By the way, it turns out they hate it when you say that. Uh, um, and, then, and then you talk to an Eastern Orthodox person, and it's like, all right, here we go. Um, but I, I think, think having a sense of Catholicity goes a long way to a building a sense of shared mission. And I think especially in a place like San Francisco, the more the church embodies that, the more powerful our, our witness is. Thank you. I really am enjoying this. Um, for me, I am just a, you know, a church goer, and yeah. um, I me too. have been, <laughs> I have been um, so attracted to church as of late mm. because I have heard speakers who are pastors talk about their own uh, need for healing, and in my estimation we're all in need of healing of course i know you agree and sometimes it feels like uh church pastors uh, this not be my pastor but um uh just the church in general gives this sense that we've got our act together yeah whereas my walk with christ is yeah. all about me understanding i mean it's just like unfolding a folding of issues but i share it with him and he helps me through it and i get better but goodness knows how much there's down there. Yeah. But um, that's all I wanted to say. Yeah. Just how refreshing and attractive it is, because we're all in need of restoration. Yes. No, I, I so appreciate it. It's funny how much we've talked about that this weekend yeah. it, with different uh, folks that um, I don't have the sociological explanation of this, but it is clear that somehow a lot of churches got invested in kind of some veneer where everybody was supposed to have it together. Whereas, isn't the church exactly the opposite? Of that? Where, where literally it's built in and week after week we confess that we don't have it all together. And so I, I think you're right. I'm, I, don't, I don't know if I sound wishy-washy or whatever, but I'm like, I'm so... Um, taken 
with the, the, the witnessing power of vulnerability and transparency and confession and honesty. And um, it seems to me that it's precisely my theology of grace and my understanding of God's covenant that gives me all the security to try to be that person, right? And um, yes, so just an amen to that. I'll ask a question. Um, a dynamic that I've experienced personally and observed as well, especially as people become maybe uh, convinced of some of your, you know, uh, vision of what the church yeah. should be, is we become on like the terms like, man, I, I want to move out of this consumeristic relationship with the church to a more deep, uh, you know, love you forever kind of thing. And then as pastors, we offer that perspective and, uh, you know, our congregants or people who are there it's like we're the really needy girlfriend all of a sudden that's like, hey, I just want to get married or the guy that's like putting on too much, you know, and the girl's like, I'm just checking this out. Yeah. And yeah. I can feel I can sense yeah. like a lot of disappointment yeah. or frustration in a yeah. world where people move and leave. Yes. How do we guard our hearts? How do we hold that mm. high vision and guard our hearts against mm. the temptation to embitterment or frustration when the person we're seeking to love forever is really interested in like a swipe relationship, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's that's. Uh, th this is, it seems to me, by the way, um, getting to trade stories with one another goes so far in being able to empathize with that situation and, and to realize you're not alone in that. Um, yeah, th it's this dance, isn't it? Because on the one hand, um, you want to be the faithful presence that will always be there, but to do that in a way that is obviously not cloying for those who maybe are like, well, easy, but also who, who just kind of cycle through. Um, yeah, man, I wish I had a better answer to that. Because it, it seems to me it has to come from a sense of your faithfully being Christ's body, not being tied to the effectiveness of enfolding everyone into that or something like that, right? Or, or, or um, uh, I, I guess it, it must surely come from a sense of cultivating your own deep sense of connectedness to God in, in a way that, uh, um, who is even more faithful than you could ever be in your best moments, right? It's, uh, sorry, I, I don't have a good answer. It's, a, it's a, such a powerful question. Um, it seems to me that it would have to be people in the trenches with you who could answer that. This, yeah. this is a little adjacent to the question, but if I could offer one thing, please, I would say, please. and this would go in concentric circles, so if you're in San Francisco, it may feel a little different than South Bay or Oakland, Berkeley, or through the tunnel, or up in Wren, um, but there's, there's almost more of a transience and a passing through or swiping right or whatever uh, if you're at center in San Francisco and then a little less so the further mm -hmm. out you go. But I think as pastors, you have to cultivate a commission mentality, like it, to almost guard yourself from that resentfulness of people coming and going. It's recognizing like part of my calling here as a minister of the gospel is I am commissioning people who may be with me for a year or two years or three years because they're going to be moving to Grand Rapids yeah. or Topeka, yeah. Kansas or wherever. Yeah. And, and it's, I, I feel like it's, 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 it's self-protective in a good way. Yeah, yeah. Um, because otherwise you just get curmudgeonly. I mean, I, I've been watching, mid, uh, was it called Midnight Mass recently? And uh, what, I, what I really um, long for, I've only seen the first episode, but uh, I long to pastor a church on an island where no one can leave or go to the yeah. other church. <laughs> it's like, oh, I've got these people, a captive audience here. It's great. Maybe, so. maybe this is also another part of like the peculiar timekeeping, which is, I, I'm just thinking about my own experience. You know, as, as an academic, you know, you go to grad school here and you go to grad school here and then your first job here. And so we were, and, and but it, now I think back to say, you know, I lived in LA for three years, was at this church. And yet, um, the role that Ron and Karen Bentley played in my life, almost, I couldn't even appreciate the significance of it till seven or eight years later. And there's a way in which your, your ministry to people is like a time capsule that, that is, might not even activate 
uh, um, you don't get to see it. This is, this is a very biblical metaphor, I think, but um, watering and planting. That doesn't take away the disappointment of, of not seeing it, but there's, there's a sense in which um, maybe it's entrusting a sense of time here as well that's operative. Yeah. And body, you know, like, and also we are being that community, not just me. Yes, that's church. right. That's right. Question. This may be like the final question too. I'm watching. Make it a good one. It's the last one. <laughs> uh, no pressure. Thank you. Um, so I was kind of struck by what you said, talking about like honesty and confession and how important that is. So my question to you is, you know, I myself am kind of in this time of like trying to get some things right, you know, yeah. and, and um, yeah. I understand that that um, confession and being open and honest with other people you know, in the church to have that community is really important. I guess my question is though, is how do you not kind of sink into that like kind of area of shame, you know, and, and letting that define you. So you're confessing yeah. somebody, but yes. not, not in a negative way, I yeah. guess I could say. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's, it's, Absolutely, the question, and and I, I think the 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 start of it, the foundation is, at the end of the day, you're not confessing to me, brother. Do you know what I mean? Like I want to be there and I want to receive you and I want to hear you, but at the end of the day, the confession is to a God who already knows and already loves you, and has and there's like literally nothing you could do to make him stop loving you. And the confession is now about your starting to experience the truth of who you are for yourself because God hears it and says, I forgive you, right? That's that and, and um, he, God, it's never shame because God's never gonna remind you about it. God's not like sort of saying, oh, I can't have this conversation. Oh, really, I did like, like there's just nothing that can't be unveiled with a God who is going to be unperturbed by it because he already knows it and he's actually already gathered all of it up into himself. And it is far as east is from the west because of what Jesus Christ has done. And that, that's, um, uh, and I, I, I just wanna say, every single day I have to keep trying to remind myself of that. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like there's no, there's no magic turning point where it's all of a sudden, oh yeah, well now everything, literally, it's a lifetime of learning to live into that. And some days I'll need you to remind me of it, right? And I'll need, uh, um, and it's why I need the practice. One, one, to me, this is a, probably because I'm a Calvinist, but I, I think the church's practice of confession is just such a crucial, like, discipline to keep me humble, to keep me open, to keep me available. Um, so that I am telling the truth about myself to the God who says, I will never leave you or forsake you. You are forgiven. Yeah. That's thank, awesome you for, thank you for yeah. sharing that. Thank you. Great question. Uh, awesome place to end. I should have told you this earlier, but would you, uh, I've loved having people who are our guests actually pray for the Bay Area and the churches sure, and yeah, just yeah, conclude yeah. our time. Yeah, absolutely. So firstly, I just want to, Thank you for being here. Thanks. So Thanks let's for me. give this guy yeah, a round of applause. Um, secondly, say uh, to you, as Nick was speaking earlier, however we can resource you, facilities, looking at housing, uh, working through cohorts, this incubator for church planters, uh, Nick and I really have a passion for the local Bay Area pastor, so please reach out to us. And before we go, Jamie, would you just yeah, pray over the pray. bay? Let's pray. Lord God, there are uh, so many stories that could be told about the Bay Area, but the one that matters is the one that you tell, which is that your spirit is afoot here and that you are living and active and that you are moving in your body thanks to these ministers and these servants of Christ. We... Um, lift them up to you for a special kind of care, for an infusion of uh, peace and rest and freedom from anxiety. We lift them up to you for um, 
a special dispensation of your care. Lord, I pray that you will raise up means of care for everyone here in ways that we couldn't have known or expected so that they can be nourished for the work that they are called to, which is to lead your body and for that body to be a hand that someone will grab hold of to be pulled from their flailing and drowning. Lord, we are so grateful that none of this work depends on us. Without you, we are nothing. We want to stay close to you as our vine. Nourish us, strengthen us, and we pray for your blessing over all of this labor and over all of this uh, um, energy so that your will might be done. We ask all of these things in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you for coming. Thank you.